Welcome and thank you very much for joining us for the Vispridge School of Leadership and Management panel discussion exploring sustainability in an interconnected world. My name is Thomas Peschkin and I'm director at the British School of Leadership here at Glasgow Caledonia University in London. For us here at the University for the Common Good, understanding how we can jointly work towards sustainability is a key theme across disciplines in our programs. The Brundtland Commission's 1983 report stated that our common future famously um, phrased that sort of sustainability definition around development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. However, aside from that sort of original, very much natural resource focused view, we also need social and economic resources. And this is reflected in today's United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. Different parts of the world experience different challenges in working towards these goals. Learning from one another about local approaches on a global scale is more important than ever in balancing our individual, societal and economic needs. Where better to have this cross-discipline discussion than here in London, I mean, even though we're just virtually here, um, as one of the global centers, home to many private and third sector organizations in a city that, contrib that, that has contributors from all across the spectrum, uh, featured last week in London Circular um, Week to discuss circular economy. Joining me here today for the panel, um, we have Ryder Marshall, a GCU London risk management graduate running her own risk management consultancy in Jordan um, in the Middle East, and has worked as a regional expert for the International Standards Organization during the revision of the ISO's risk management guidelines. We also have Ario um, Ziglio as a public health research and former head of World Health Organization Europe office and honorary professor here at GCU London. His focus area has been on investment and development for public health. We have Ima Gorta, um, a co-founder of Y, a social impact strategy consultancy in the Netherlands, working with public and private organizations to enhance their social footprint. And sharing is Natasha Ratcliffe thomas a GC London's professor for marketing and sustainable business, whom, we'll be, who, whom I will be handing over just now to, to direct and uh, um, form the discussion between us. Lovely. Thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you to our guests for joining in what I know will be a fascinating and insightful discussion. So we're going to kick off with what might seem like a really obvious question, but I'm really interested to hear your responses to what is sustainability? Because I want to know, does it mean the same thing for everyone, both in principle and practice? And um, Ario, I'd like to start with your perspective. What does sustainability mean within a public health context? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm delighted to be here with you and to share my, my experience and some reflection on the issue of the day. Well, um, I, I think that the has forced us in public health to reflect on this issue of uh, sustainability, health sustainability. My uh, personal reflection that is also shared by some other scientists is that uh, if we want to strengthen sustainability in the context of public health, then we can really on uh, human health. I think about the pandemia and the causes of the pandemia, it is clear that in the future we have to focus more and more on health, but uh, uh, the health of animals, the health of the overall environment, so without an approach that is comprehensive, holistic, more than 60 years ago, the World Health Organization talked about one health. We talked about one health, humans, the plants, the animals, the overall environment. We are not going to be sustainable in the future. We will always be at risk of pandemia, uh, uh, other kind of uh, uh, hazards, etc. Um, so I think I want Perhaps, to, but um, uh, to think that we need a new framework to think about uh, sustainability within the context of public health. I think the the One Health concept now they call it uh, circular uh, health. I know that you talk about uh, circular e economics. Uh, I think is the way to go. more on this perhaps later. Okay, 
That's Thank lovely. You. Thanks for kicking us off with that. And so, Ryder, I'd like to come to you uh, with the same question, really. What does sustainability mean within your specific context? Um, yes, sustainability is, from this management perspective, is a capacity for long-term continuation, uh, despite all the challenges uh, and uncertainties. So here, for future prosperities and resilience, um, we need to consider the limited resources, and uh, starting from the capacity in terms of time, uh, knowledge, skills, including ecological system, ecological system, sorry. And that requesting as much the efficient integration with the social and economic factors from one side and the environmental uh, factor from the other side, including full consideration for uh, the world safety, the place where we have, it's the only place we, where we can live. So from this point, risk management is about the long term and the future management for the uncertainty and the resilience enhancement to organization, vision and mission, maintaining and the creation value. Then sustainable business and um, sustainable growth, one of our serious challenges uh, to manage the limited resources uh, managing uh, risk should engage with all related uncertainties to provide efficient usage for these resources in terms of sustainable business and prosperous uh, um, growth. It's not about just continuation. So um, we need also to consider within all these things the ethical commitments um, and business reputation to maintain or related to stakeholders. And here I'm talking about the stakeholders, uh, how we define them as uh, the individuals or organizations who can uh, affect or be affected or perceive themselves to be affected by organization decision or activity. So it's about sustainable business in terms of ethical and continuation growth. Lovely. Thank you so much. And so, Ime, turning to you now, what, how do you um, define sustainability within the sort of business and organisational piece? Yeah, well, the way I see sustainability, it's about creating a positive impact on the planet and everyone on it through the activities you undertake as a business. So another way of saying that is that Sustainability means that as a business, you can keep doing what you are doing for a hundred years and everyone around you will be better off, all your stakeholders. So nature, uh, your customers, but also your employees, uh, your business partners and society at large. And sustainability is about incorporating these practices that will make that happen. So it is about uh, sourcing of resources, like you cut trees, you make sure new trees are, are growing. Uh, it's about giving a livable wage to your employees and, and so forth. It's a really a broad scope of uh, I take on sustainability and it's all about creating this net positive impact. Lovely, thank you. And just to round off this sort of question, Thomas, and obviously loads of different things have been covered by the mm -hmm. other um, panelists. How then do we understand sustainability within the higher education context? Thank you, Natasha. Uh, I think for us, the, the challenge around sustainability and, and agreeing with, with all three previous speakers in terms of the different perspectives on what sustainability means in the practical context then, for us, I think in higher education, the challenge is often how do we get graduates ready for that? How do we, how do we as higher education, as an environment, create the right study support, et cetera, or discussions like, like these to, to develop future leaders um, that have sustainability or have a different sustainability understanding that that takes these different perspectives into account. And that that is quite a challenge when you're trying to balance subject benchmarks, you know, achieving a subject specific outcome, yet you're trying to to think um, f into the future, like Ryder was saying, of something that is is maybe not just the current understanding, but also creating a critical thinker that is able to to identify where something might stop sustainability in taking place and, and fostering that, that discussion in higher education. 
That's great. Thank you, everyone. So I can see that everyone's outlined, you know, within their definitions, some really positive aspirations. So now that we've kind of established some parameters and understandings, I'd like to know what the panelists consider currently to be the greatest threats to achieving sustainability. And I'm going to direct this question first to Aereo. So what you consider the biggest threats to achieving sustainability? Well, if you think in terms of public health, let me try to be a little bit provocative here. <laughs> if you think about public health or health in general, uh, we are, uh, we in our sector, we are very, uh, let's say, dependent to a certain extent, not just on what we do internally to, um, to ensure that we have good uh, hospitals hospital to ensure that we got good health care, to ensure that we got good public health programs. But we are, because if you go to a, a first aid hospital today, uh, to any kind of hospital or primary health care, uh, you find patient, people queuing, waiting room, and uh, they are perhaps the res result of problems which are not caused by the health sector. There are problems caused from outside a very bad anti-poverty program policy in the country. I can tell you, you're going to have a lot of public health pro problems. If you uh, mess up in terms of schemes, uh, housing, urban planning, etc., etc., at the end of the day, these are not health problems to start with, but they become health problems. Mental health problems, uh, non-communicable diseases, uh, and indeed, even the pandemia, as I mentioned in my first, <laughs> I try to address your first question, it is the result of uh, bringing different words together, uh, human health, animal health, the health of plants, the overall environment. So to trust your question, I would say there are a number of things that we need to do in more or differently in the future. First of, first of all, we need to have more focus on strengthening the resilience of our sector, also or the other sectors that are presented in the panel. If you take uh, the common goods as a criteria, for example, or sustainability or equity, we need to focus much more on addressing the environment and of health and the big inequities which are related to, uh, to that. Uh, um, we need to focus on how to reposition within overall development, economic development and social, de and social development. There is no development without health. No development without health. On the same time, at the same time, the good development population health. And uh, there are many things that we need to do, but because I have no time to, to explore this issue uh, in full, I would just stop by saying that we need to reshape also the health system. We need to have a much better combination between uh, what I call it territorial services, primary health care, prevention, health promotion with the uh, high-tech uh, hospital sectors. And uh, we governance, intersectoral governance, I will explore it perhaps more later, uh, for population health. And here, when I say governance, is the link between our sector and the sector of the business uh, uh, or uh, other part of the economics and the environment. So much time to explore it properly. So I stop here. Thank you. And Ryder, I'd like to ask you the same question. You talked already about things around risk and resilience um, and, and continuity. What do you think that the greatest threats are to achieving sustainability? And maybe that's picking up on some of those points. Yes. Actually, as the rapid changes make things um, happen sometimes in a quick way that we can't be prepared for. Uh, so we need the crisis management along with risk management in such, in such cases and the uh, corona bring that uh, path. So, and another, yes, the COVID brings many new organizations' behaviors uh, to manage uh, this uncertainty. So 
with current responses for long care uh, to manage the worst scenarios case and emerging risk, in addition to exploit the opportunities they may discover during this crisis and what uh, we need to go through all these things and we need to uh, find uh, or to make like a scenario analysis to uh, um, manage all these uncertainties uh, to uh, discover uh, what we can sort uh, or how we can sort things, uh, what uh, we can live with the new uh, practices or new behaviors, what we can live with, what we already start to uh, get used about and feel happy with sometimes, and what they, uh, or organization they can't uh, cope with in terms of their resilience and limitation uh, for enablers. The massive things here that are limited, uh, it's not limited in the COVID and the, the vaccine, it's about the consequences, uh, about the COVID hospitalities, the uh, vaccine safety, and broader also than that, the consequence of these things, social, economic, cultural, and uh, political factors. So starting from organization, main assets, the human capital, and the safety, what is the human skills we need also? Uh, now we are looking for um, uh, this new skills sometimes uh, in terms of the high volatility of consequences, uh, the validity of organization, mission, vision, and um, objective. We need to revisit all these things. Actually, others need a brave uh, mind to revisit with an honest, not like, um, uh just for uh, a window dressing with a window dressing we need to make that so we need to be uh, very serious to revisit all these things in terms of these consequences and uncertainties also to take care about the weak signals that may emerge in your risk uh, so these things we need to consider uh, also the uh, updating for all these things, I, uh, I think uh, the method also for communication, vertical and horizontal, we need to consider. And the method, the uh, way uh, um, the organ where the organization need to, uh, or how the organization need to make decision, recording the decision, delivering the decision, communicating is something very important now. Uh, how they need uh, to getting their feedback. For other, with other parties, they call that, uh, to uh, control their commitments and uh, make a better performance uh, within all these challenges. Uh, also, time management and operational level, uh, if we are talking or uh, considering the uh, limitation in time and uh, working our reductions. Uh, so we need maybe to develop, for instance, um, uh, controlling, um, uh, developing or control, uh, uh, controlling KPIs uh, to uh, improve uh, the uh, working hours uh, uh, in terms of uh, this uh, limitations, new limitation. Also, uh, maybe we need to um, um, recalculation uh, for our uh, production. Um, uh, the um, capacity, our capacity, the new capacity, the shortage in um, in, in um, many in, in, in many elements involved with our work. So all these things we need to be revisited in order to uh, be sure how we can make that uh, things happen or how we can enhance our resilience in order to go forward uh, with our business. Thank you. So thank you, Ariel and Ryder. You've raised a lot of challenges there. And at the top of the discussion, we were highlighting, you know, what, what some of the different areas and that's sort of really echoing what we're seeing in, in from um, the chat as well, where people are, you know, asking questions about which areas, you know, we, we need to look at and have this kind of holistic approach. 
So I'm going to come to Ime and Thomas now, and I'm going to ask you if we sort of open up the conversation more broadly, how do you see these current challenges that have been identified fitting into some of the broader trends? But also more than that, why do organizations seem to struggle so much to address them? And if I come to you first, Ime, thank you. So, well, I think ultimately it has to do with that organizations are now starting to recognize that they have a responsibility to fulfill that goes beyond their financial responsibility to shareholders to create a return on investment, to basically make them money. And the world of business has for a long time operated from this central idea that a successful business is one that creates a return on investment year after year, makes their owners money. And while this is still, of course, important, now we start to emerge that an awareness starts to emerge that a business should have other priorities, which is taking care of its stakeholders, like ethically uh, and responsibly mining resources, for example, uh, offering sustainable living wages. And so to answer your questions, what I think the struggle is for business is to deal with this real, real, this new reality where they have to uh, tackle these res responsibilities and priorities and integrate them into the business model. But uh, if I can flip your question around a little bit, I like to talk about the opportunities that organizations are having uh, to to become more sustainable and, and like and and the benefits that they can they can gain from. Uh, from adopting sustainable practices, because ultimately it's about the true costs they have to uh, they have to account for. And one of the opportunities I see is that uh, businesses that are uh, taking leadership in, in sustainable practices, they will have a competitive advantage. They will are most likely to grow as a business because in their their suppliers and their their, their buyers they they demand more and more that organizations become sustainable for example the government in their tenders to businesses is asking for uh, insurances and commitments on sustainable practices like if we buy resources from you we have to make sure that these resources are ethically sourced uh, a big even maybe larger scale example is this is, is the EU taxon the, the European Union taxonomy initiative which basically says if you as a business want to do business in the Europe, if you want to trade with Europe, you need to make sure that your supply chain is up to standards. So the, the whole idea of, oh, uh, we have people in Bangladesh working in sweatshops for five cents an hour, you know, not our responsibility. We just, uh, we, kick it, we kick the bucket across, we let someone else do it. It's becoming rapidly history. It's, 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 uh, it's not part of our modern times anymore soon. So, uh i guess that gives a bit of an answer to your question right now it's, it's this change of priorities and as the business world is adapting to that and those who adapt fastest will, will come out on top great thank you and thank you for flipping the question because i think that really also leads uh you know opens the the door for for thomas to come in so thomas how do you see you know a, a, in a whole range of current challenges but how do you see those fitting into the broader trends and, and why do organizations seem to struggle to address them and uh, thank you, Natasha. And I think just keeping an eye on the chat, there's also somebody asking, so, so how do organizations do that? Or how does that, how is that being picked up? And um, I think I'd like to bring in some of the discussions we're having with professional bodies. So for example, the Chartered Insurance Institute or the, the Chartered Management Institute that are saying it's all, it's all fine that we, that we talk about sustainability and that we're trying to define it, et cetera. But what is really missing in organizations, what organizations are longing for is not necessarily more graduates with the same skill, but maybe just better or fine tune that skill or subject expertise, but but a, but that that critical mindset, that that um, new way of thinking, of looking at it and trying to see and, and think of it differently, but then to also lead that thought. So somebody who's who's able to think outside the box, to think about different ways of, imp of impact, of, of trying to bring these different things together, but then also to be able to articulate that as a, as a leader, not necessarily as a, in, in a senior leadership position, but a graduate that is able to lead from below, to, to lead within a team, to be able to articulate in a way that, that things could be done differently. And I think that's where 
um, Ryder's expertise comes in in terms of organizational culture and risk management, you know, having, having organizations as a whole that are more mindful of their impact of, of how things are being influenced. It's looking at um, what Ariel was talking about in terms of the, the connectivity between different activities within, within a society. And that's where you look at um, Hans Rosalind's TED talk, for example, about prosperity and health, that you have to have health within society first before you can drive prosperity. So if you then talk about what Ema was talking about in terms of organizations needing to find a way of of doing that, of not just being driven by by capitalizing on the money, but trying to see how how they can drive forward their agenda whilst taking into account the, the various different stakeholders and having a po more positive impact, that requires that requires people that have that mindset, and it's it's a challenge for people if they're in their current setting in a workplace and are doing their day to day job over and over again. There's often very little space or headspace to think about doing it differently. And I think very often university or education or a continuous professional development course is often that, that opportunity for somebody to step out of this, challenge their current way of thinking and coming out with a different approach and different way of looking at something. And, and I think that's, that's the bottom line that we hear from the professional bodies and industry organizations, that there's a lack of leaders who who have that vision and, can, and are able to articulate it. And I think that's that's often a challenge, isn't it? You have people that have a vision, but not necessarily able to articulate how or what that, how that could be done. Um, and that discrepancy between you know, people that, that are possibly very passionate about it, but not able to, to think about how that could be done. And the, the question of how that is in the chat is nagging me in terms of, you know, how do we actually do that? How do we enforce that? And Ema's mentioning of the supply chains changing and the dynamics of it changing. You've got the German parliament trying to legislate how supply chains need to be more responsible and who is going to be accountable for it. But really the sort of the, the legislation, the regulations behind it is, is trying to, to, to put that into tighter confines, which actually is very difficult to police. It's much easier in, in some ways of changing mindsets on a broader scale amongst graduates so that there is a more of a shared understanding of what one should be doing, um, possibly as a global citizen, rather than just saying, well, oh, here's the legislation that we need to follow. So if you have a mindset in an organization that understands that five cents an hour in Bangladesh in a sweatshop is not appropriate in achieving a, a, a sustainable um, way of working, then you don't need that legislation. So, I mean, the two are not necessarily inseparable. You, you probably do need some rules that, that, that will shape this, but equally you have the professional bodies and industry associations crying out that there is a lack of, of that sort of fresh thought of critical thinking of not just doing well or better what we do now, but thinking about how we can do it differently to have a different sort of impact. Um, and I think that's that's a challenge for us to, to, to rebalance on how we educate graduates that that we have those graduates that, that industries is looking for or organizations are looking for. Lovely, thank you. And I just want to remind people if they want to ask more questions as you're doing, we do have the Q&A um, function. And thank you everyone, because again, you know, you've, you've each talked about some kind of specifics, but you've also talked about things that stretch across disciplines and across regions, for example, the, the kind of supply chains and, and public health. So today's panel, as you know, is focusing on the concept of this interconnected world. And I wanna ask the panelists now, to what extent they consider these changes to be localized or global? And does that make it easier or harder, I guess, to work towards sustainability? And I'm gonna to come to you first, Aereo, please. So the question is really about this interconnectedness, localization and globalization. Natasha, first of all, can you hear me properly? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Now. I will address your, your question, but um, allow me to make a reflection on, particularly on uh, uh, Thomas, uh, Ime, and Deraida. Are we learning from from changes? I mean, now we're going to a big, uh, facing big change because of the pandemic, but this is not the first time society, our countries, our community, had to deal with a big change. Allow me to, to share a little experience. 
uh, from my work. In the, the 1990s in Europe, there's been enormous changes after the dissolution of um, the Soviet Union. And uh, uh, we, our regional European office moved from 32 countries to over 50 countries. And no new country, it's a new situation, etc. And uh, I was in a position to hire people. And the market there, people knowing everything about public health or medical doctors, but that's not the kind of people that I need to work to these countries. I needed people that in addition of a strong background in terms of public health, they could combine it with some understanding of economic development and legislation. Some of these countries have to write a new constitution, for example. And <laughs> like uh, the problem that we had in 1980s, that we have to think about which kind of future managers, let's say, I don't know, future uh -huh. leaders we want to in, the, in the future. This still in university, far too much over specialization. And I think I reckon, uh, you know, what you're trying to do at the uh, class of Caledonia University is very important in my that's a question. I'm sorry, I don't want to, 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 to avoid asking the, the uh, try to ask to, uh, to do the question. I would like to go by the Sustainable Development Goals because uh, Thomas has mentioned, uh, Natasha, you mentioned it uh, too. Uh, the, we all agree with the Sustainable Development Goals, right? I'm in the development of the social uh, uh, of the SDGs. But there is one difficult question that we don't ask ourselves much. This, you know. And the question is the following one, which I think it is linked to, 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 to the topic of we are dealing today. If the sustainable development goals by using the same kind of decision making processes that has put the world in this mess. That's the unique <laughs> address this question, but you know, if we don't address that question, the sustainable development goals will not be achieved. It means that we need uh, different decision making processes. A big role of communities in that, different type of leaders, a high performing organizations. Our, our organization and our institution, they're not performing at the speed and at the quality uh, that, that uh, the SDGs require. And this is a big role for universities as well, I think. I mean, uh, I would like to go more in depth about how do we build uh, highly performing organization and how can we change the present type of decision-making processes that we have. If we are not able to address these two issues, the SDGs are fantastic, but the becomes a little bit like a dream. I like dreams, but I would like to realize those dreams, to make them real reality. It's been too long. I apologize for that. Not at all. And I think, I mean, in a sense, although you, um, you know, talked about not really addressing the question, I think your example was a very good example of the need to understand both a local and a global context and how that might actually require different types of skills and I think you've given us a very good example of what's uh, you know what a very clear barrier towards achieving sustainability might be. So Ime, I'm going to come to you now with the, with the same kind of question around this interconnectedness and, and the chat changes that you see maybe in business I mean you talked about this push towards more responsible business is that something that's happening at a global level is it very localized and and does do these changes in fact make it easier to work towards sustainability yeah that's a great question and it's definitely happening on a global level and I think the interesting thing is because this interconnected connectedness is happening globally we start to pay more attention to local factors so to give you an example, supply chain data is becoming smarter and uses new tech like satellite tracking of crops and forests. And this makes it easier for organizations to keep a tab on what's going on across the world and take the responsibility. Unilever, for example, is doing this right now to see how their farmers in their supply chain are doing. And if the forests that they are uh, cut down for farmland, if it's done in a responsible and sustainable, sustainable manner. So at the same time, you have this 
mo this international well conglomerate large organization that can zoom in on the smallest level in any in a country to make sure that these practices align and I think in that way we live in a very exciting time how these both things are coming together and and and, and generate new new practices and, and innovation and um i also like to quickly respond to a point uh, point irio made and also thomas about how do you get the build these successful organizations maybe from a people perspective and like thomas mentioned like how do we give people get people in this in this uh how, how can they make a change how can they get into these leadership roles and what i see is that the world of business in a way is a bit lagging here a lot of young very talented people are right now like kind of clashing with organizations or like getting stuck in old systems like they have to w work the corporate ladder or they have to do things the way things have been done for a long time and they usually want to move faster than the organizations that they are uh, operating in and they should uh, so the interesting thing what is happening now because well no no two businesses are like that some businesses are developing a competitive advantage by offering meaningful meaningful work people want their work to be meaningful we we, we well i think in the west at least we have this we are in this luxurious position that we don't just work for the money we can now work for things that we truly care about and you see that organization that are offering uh young people the opportunity to perform meaningful work like uh, help other people thrive or preserve nature and incorporate that in their day-to-day -day job those are the most attractive jobs. Those are the most attractive organizations to work for. So organizations that put sustainability first, whether it's in health or on nature, on nature or on other specs of sustainability, they are developing a competitive advantage because they are attracting the best people. And I think that's a great development. And I think that will be also a key driver in uh, performance enhancement of these organizations. The most sustainable organizations will get the best people. Great, thank you. And so, Thomas, obviously, you know, um, being based in London, we're in a very international um, sort of environment anyway. And luckily, we have students come, you know, with us from all parts of the world, albeit online at the moment. So, how would you sort of uh, interpret this question? How the changes um, are localized and globalized, and whether that makes things easier to work towards sustainability? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think there's there's a challenge around us looking often at, at our immediate environment to, to, to see how we can fix things. And we have somewhat barriers that we don't necessarily always see in, in the way to, to looking beyond to see if there's other solutions. So, um, and I, I think some of that is connected to also the, what Ari was saying in terms of the decision-making process that we always follow the same sort of process of trying to come to, to a decision. We've a couple of years ago, we've had a workshop with some of our MBA students in New York, and the the students, especially from from India, were taken aback by how big the potholes in New York were. You know, they talked about, well, we don't actually do that in India because we use our plastic waste to fill those potholes because the plastic waste lasts longer than um, than the tarmac and is more heat resistant and temperature resistant. So they were saying, well, that that's our solution. We thought this was just us in India trying to get rid of our rubbish and finding a local solution to kind of have a win-win. And, and I think that's, that was, to me, a very much an eye-opener of how, of how we sometimes just need to look beyond our existing environment, our existing context, to maybe see if somebody else has thought of how to construct that wheel already and we don't have to reinvent it. But I think that's, that's where maybe some of, maybe a sort of meta-level challenge actually just starts of how do we engage with um, with people across different disciplines in, in, in different uh, regions of, those, of this world, or maybe even in the same region, but in, in a very different cultural context. How do we engage with these people to, to understand what their approach or their perspective has been on uh, in, in solving or addressing a particular challenge? We're working currently on a capacity building project in Latin America where um, in universities in Latin America talking about the, one of the bigger challenges is not talking with other Spanish-speaking communities, but actually some of their more indigenous communities within their own countries and trying to see what what their values are, you know, what is it that is important for them as an output for a solution and then therefore how to how to formulate or approach a problem. So mixing those things and, and being able to to cross 
not just outside of your own discipline area to to address what Ari was saying and of having a broader mindset of bringing those different perspectives together, but also across the world. I mean, how often are we confined by what language we speak in order to be able to look and read up other other solutions? Um, you know, so understanding or developing a, a particular skill set of being able to cross into different cultural settings, to cross different disciplines and being able to to listen to those different views is a particular skill set you, that you develop. And that's often is part of you know, your intercultural competence that is crossing, I suppose, cultural dis or discipline cultures, but also um, regional cultures, et cetera, of, of developing that skill set of understanding the, the listening, the, the attitude to, towards being open towards these kind of views is something that is needed for us to bring those things together in order to formulate um, to formulate uh, responses that are, that are suitable of, of, of bringing these, I suppose, these different push and pull factors together and being able to understand why some of them are pulling us one way and others are pushing us into a different direction. You need to have that, that, that skills, that competence to be able to look beyond your very narrow discipline, your narrow local context to understand some of the global alternatives and what that means in the bigger scale. Um, to to be able to for, to have that new visionary mindset of being able to to put something forward that might be doing things differently. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's important. Thank you. And again, we've got some really interesting um, examples there of, of both sort of challenges and opportunities. I think so. Um, and. And each of you have touched on this, how societal needs are moving, you know, in, in one direction and, and organizations are all, almost in a sense trying to adjust and, and manage um, their risk, I guess, uh, and their exposure. And you talked about things like competitive advantage, and I suppose the opposite of that is, is losing out because, you, you know, you're not ahead of the game. So how do we support sort of changes in, in, in those directions? And I'm going to um, ask you, Area really, maybe thinking from the public health perspective more about policies and things. I mean, we've got a lot of questions in the chat about how do we do these things? So have you got some um, kind of concrete examples of how we can make connections to enable more sustainable development? Okay, well, uh, allow me to have some a link with the, something or a word. Here. Uh, of a word that Prida um, mentioned. She mentioned the term re resilience. And resilience, if you look at the sustainable development goals, goals, resilience. But what does it mean in practice? Because I think that we are able to support and, and to strengthen resilience at your level community level and uh, system level or to the kind of development of change that uh, the panel here is, is, is talking about. <clears throat> what I mean by resilience, I mentioned there are three levels and number, if you look at the scientific literature, which I have reviewed recently, the capacity of resilience. The first is the capacity to adapt. And we've seen different community adapting in a different way vis-a-vis -vis the pandemic, for example. The capacity to accept that we have a problem uh, and to try to somehow to cope with that. But that's not enough. Sorted uh, capacity. That means not just to accept that the things are changing or accept that you have a, bad, a, a very bad uh, or life threatening diagnosis, another health problem. It's the capacity to utilize all kinds of resources that you have. You as an individual, within the family, within the community sectors and the social sectors, to better manage the this situation. But that is still not enough in terms of the sustainable development goal. Uh, again, uh, Raida uh, mentioned um, en passant, uh, it is the capacity to anticipate, ladies and gentlemen, you going to have other kind of pandemic, other kind of hazards, other, cli other ki uh, kind of uh, climate. Are we prepared? Can we anticipate the kind of, the, the kind of problem we're going, we're going to have? 
And finally, we need what we call it uh, transformative resilience. Is the capacity, this mainly applies to system really, but is the yeah. capacity of system, it could be the system sector or uh, Thomas, it is more of the education sector, my sector is the health sector, is the capacity of the system to transform itself uh-huh. when dealing with uh, big changes or when um, traditional practices have become obsolete because of cultural changes or political, technological, scientific uh, uh, breakthrough. So I, I, in conclusion, I think that sustainability, more sustainable you are, less vulnerable you are. Uh-huh. But if you think about it, the level of vulnerability of us as individual, community and system, the level of risk that we are dealing with, the level of risk minus the resilience capacity I just mentioned uh, of examples, but I don't think that we have the time. So I stop here. I think I, I think I gave gave you perhaps the the, the idea, the kind of approach. Uh, we need to link sustainability and the, all these three levels. Great, thank you. Now I can't see you on camera, Ryder, but are you still with us to give your opinion about how we manage operational risk? Um, I, I, I'm with you. I'm hearing everyone. Uh, actually, yes. Um, for that, um, uh, working on strengthening the organization resilience, I'm here. I'm also confirm what uh, is coming from Professor Edo. Um, that by um, increasing the ability to observe and adapt with changes to keep achieving our goals as an organization. So that's it's not easy thing, but especially when we are working with the high level of uncertainties during our time now with COVID. So uh, the, the, the unexpected disruption as COVID and its consequences with the quick amendments as uh, reaction and interaction with pandemic and uh, its impact on short, long, medium, and long, by doing several analyses, such as impact analysis with, uh, as we mentioned before, for avoiding forward, for window dressing. So we need to have the courage to be honest with uh, ourselves as an organization to, um, uh, and, and work maybe with, uh, where is that applicable, where the recovery is a stage uh, to look uh, through the opportunities to learn from bad decisions because we uh, got several bad decisions uh, in this uh, experience uh, and we still maybe. So we need to uh, look uh, uh, for data that overvalued or devaluated um, the biases, the limitation and control over the information, the collective information. So all these things we need to take it and make the, uh, a real scenario analysis, analysis that uh, reflect all these lessons in, uh, in that uh, analysis. And then the uh, solutions that balance between the healthy environment from one side and the healthy economic and social factors from the other side. So again, for with risk management, it's not a one size fits all, the solution, absolutely, because uh, everyone yeah, is facing, uh, for instance, uh, the COVID crisis now, but each organization has different objectives, different enablers, different internal and external conditions and uh, context. So the high cost of selfish behavior, I'm sorry, uh, here to go to this point, uh, of the groups at a smaller scale, uh, what we call in uh, economic, that the self-sufficiency, including the unsecure long run uh, future for this attitude contradict with the factor that the human are social creatures by nature. And thus the imagined uh, community that we form like family, country, religion, color, always are vulnerable to being undermined according. So another point, uh, as we know from macroeconomic, the perspective of uh, the calculation of 
uh, the production cost is not always with nationalization concept. Uh, one more from risk management perspective, we are uh, recognized that there is nothing called risk transfer. The contemporary risk management, there is nothing uh, called risk transfer. So the outsource, uh, um, um, the outsource supply uh, or the outsource uh, side uh, also bring, yes, bring risk. It's about the cost benefit analysis, not wasting our energy in something that will bring uh, more benefit if that done by someone else. So we need to have an open mind. Uh, also, we need to consider the waste opportunities in statistical language. So we need to use science to control all these uncertainties and open mind. The goal for most organization in the meantime is enhancing resilience. And again, the, the resilience is the ability to observe and adopt with the changing to skip uh, achieving our goal. It's not about the profit. It's about our goal and vision and mission. So here, uh, we um, need to have a serious visit to our organization structure, our vision, our mission, short, medium, and long-term objectives. A serious con consideration for a wider scope of capabilities that was mentioned by, I think, all of us. Uh, and diversification encompasses worldwide people, integration for long-run positive impact and interaction, uh, knowledge capture and the growth perception and interpretation because we need to consider the cultures. So uh, the context changes and variabilities and control, controlling um, over all these things, controlling the capabilities. So for instance, if we are talking about the lockdown uh, as a government decision, so organization may find, may can find several um, um, options to solve that and that depends on their uh, as we mentioned their situation and their business and their objectives so maybe that can be the solution uh, um, uh, increasing um, uh, individual produ productivity can be starting from developing controls in terms of remote working for instance to developing a temporary close on-site safe in internal environment for employees. And that's actually happened in some plants here in Georgia. So there is nothing right or wrong uh, in this stage. Uh, each organization needs to manage their individual challenges to enhance uh, their resilience. Uh, so open mind and healthy information, I think, some organization maybe need to make a complete reinvention for their goal because uh, um, now we found that uh, pandemic brings something in new, completely new for business uh, environment. So sometimes, yeah, uh, or it's not, uh, sorry, it's not sometimes. Uh, nowadays, we found that some uh, work or business uh, is very close to be finished in this uh, situation. So that's need to consider that and make a reinvention for their goals, mission, vision, uh, business transformation, uh, where others may be need for a little to high operational restructuring. So all these things we need to consider and to be, as I mentioned before, have the brave and honest, need to be honest with ourselves to consider all these uh, uncertainties and to know how we can achieve our goal. Maybe to have uh, um, a, a complete change, maybe we need to make a little changes to go forward. Thank you. And Thomas, I'm going to come to you now. And having heard what each of the other panelists have said, I mean, working in higher education now, which again, our context has completely um, changed and can be relooked at. How do we go about as an organization ourselves, um, you know, achieving all of these different varied asks of us? Uh, thank you, Natasha. And uh, looking at some of the questions coming through the chat as well, I think that's a very important challenge for us to very consciously address because one of the 
one of the members in the audience says, well, it's nice that, that Europe has these lovely solutions and, and guidelines, but what about us in Nigeria who, who have a challenge around the oil drilling, the, local, the impact on the local population, etc.? So this, I think for higher education, it's very important to recognize that this is not a one-way directional way of developing this. This is not just about us defining what the best solution is. This is also about us in higher education understanding what these different varied local conditions are and what the bigger pressure points are. Because what, what Ryder was saying, those are different for different organizations, for different contexts. And um, for us to simply, within our London context, to simply define what is maybe just suitable for London would be very short-sighted because it, it forgets some of the more complex and uh, longer supply chains. It forgets the bigger impact on societal health, maybe in other parts of the world that are connected through the supply chains. Um, so I think the challenge for us in higher education is how do we integrate some of those things into our understanding, into our discussions, so that so that we're not too short-sighted, that we develop people that that learn to be brave, to, to use writer's words, you know, that, that learn to be brave as, as students to, to share their local context, their local constraints, so that when people in, graduate and go back into other parts of the world, to be mindful of that there are other connections that have different constraints, different challenges that might actually stop us somewhere else to, to do something. So for us in higher education, I think it's, it's a challenge to, to foster that open discussion as part of our um, as part of our teaching, as part of our programs, and that is within the discipline. So, if if I pick up on um, that sort of braveness and thinking forward, if you look at what our risk management pro or our insurance program does, thinking about emerging risk and emerging markets, or the risks around automation and digitalization, this whole artificial intelligence, and us not having an answer for it yet. Education also needs to foster that discussion to allow students, especially at master's level, to contribute to us hearing what those students have to say from different parts of the world, to then shape that discussion and, and hopefully support the development of new brave arguments that people can take into organizations. And I think that's, that's very important that we understand ourselves as not just knowledge transfer you know, organisms, but actually places where we foster those discussions to further our understanding, to be brave and find ways of, you know, what Eric was saying, decision-making processes that are different to how they used to be, to be able to, to be more sustainable. Thank you. So we're coming into the closing sort of moments of the um, of the session. So I do want to thank everyone for sharing your insights and experiences. But I'm going to ask each speaker just to share a sort of 30 second takeaway, maybe that you've picked up from participating in this sort of interconnected and globally connected panel on sustainability. So Ima, I'm going to come to you first. Have you got a 30 second takeaway? Um. Well, my takeaway is, is I, I get I, uh, I see that there are a lot of ways to view at uh, issues which are in the end I think very similar. So, and that that gives me some well that makes me optimistic because then it's only a bit about language and not what the things we care about at heart. They seem to be the same. So, my takeaway is maybe start for me at least is to start by expressing that like i think we find the same things very important we might be just going about it in different ways well let's see how we where we overlap and how we can uh contribute to each other's understanding thank you erio how about you what's your takeaway well first of all thank you uh, for uh, the webinar, I learned a lot from you. Um, more than that, away is a further reflection. Uh, also, reading the question uh, uh, from, uh, from the audience, we have to ensure sustainability is not just a PR kind of things from uh, public sector or private sector. So, there was a specific question uh, on that. And this uh, reminds me perhaps of, of something we haven't mentioned uh, in the panel, but the need perhaps to change the way we communicate. The ability uh, is always communicated in a kind of 
threatened way. It is about a question of life and death, survival, which is okay. It is absolutely, uh, it's also related to, to, uh, to life, to the joy of life, to happiness, to serenity, to less problems and so on. So this is my, ref my reflection in addition to all the things that I learned. It might be that perhaps you want to have a web webinar on this issue of how we come to just to give information is about to make change happen. Thank you. Excellent. Thomas, anything in the closing seconds? Maybe just that I feel quite encouraged by some of the student points that see those connections. You know, like I mentioned a bit earlier about the Europe-Nigeria connection of understanding those things. So I'm, I'm quite encouraged that students have that, or people in the in the chat have that awareness and the willingness, the the, the drive to wanting to find something. And I think having those kind of discussions hopefully helps us to to be able to connect those different dots of perspective. And I think that's that's very important and quite encouraging. Ryder, anything from you? Yes, again, uh, I want to confirm that uh, organization can uh, um, manage these uh, big challenges and I'm talking about challenges which uh, may uh, carry opportunities and difficulties. So we can manage that by uh, first we need to know that there is nothing one size fits all. We need to deal with all our uh, external and internal factors in order to go forward. Just we need to concentrate on our goals and how we are going to continue with sustainability and to be happy with achieving our goals as much as we can. That's all. Thank you. So I'd like to thank all of our panelists for sharing their insights and experiences. And I think although we identified some complex issues and challenges, um, our panel have shown by working at how by working across and between different disciplines and fields of work with a global mindset, we can build new collaborations and find creative, sustainable solutions. So I'd like to thank all the panelists and say goodbye to our audience. Thank you for watching us. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.